So welcome everyone to tonight's uh, constitutional conversation put on by the Constitutional Law Center here. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Mila Sahoni uh, from uh, far from the gorgeous place of San Diego. She's a professor at the University of San Diego Law School. And let me tell you, she is a rising star. Uh, she has this in the past year published two of what I think are the most interesting, among the most interesting uh, uh, legal articles that I have uh, stumbled across. And she's going to be presenting that's of one of them, I hope without all the footnotes, but to tell us the, the good parts. And, uh, and the other that I think is very impressive is on the uh, Supreme Court's emerging major questions doctrine. But tonight, she's talking on the extremely intriguing topic of originalism in civil procedure. And I don't think anyone has done anything on this before, have they? I think this is really an original idea, but as soon as you think about it, this is something that uh, there's just so much there because our world of litigation is so <coughs> different from the world of litigation at the time of the founding. Our understanding of juries is different. Our understanding of the role of the judge is different. Our understanding of a cause of action, how what it takes to get into court is a is entirely different. Uh, issues like standing, uh, uh, personal jurisdiction, service of process, all of these things are so different. And so uh, <clears throat> no wonder there's so many people here to hear this uh, great talk. So well, I, I'll sit down, and, uh, and uh, uh, Mila's going to be speaking, as usual, in the format for you know, 25 minutes or so. And afterwards, uh, well, we welcome questions, uh, and you'll come down and, and speak into these microphones. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Michael, for inviting me here tonight. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, for uh, organizing this event. It's, it's a real honor and a pleasure for me to be here, and I'm so delighted and happy to see so many people uh, here in the audience tonight. So this lecture is going to be about two things that uh, individually are each going to be familiar to you, but that when you put them together are a very odd couple. And those two things are originalism and civil procedure. <coughs> so nobody here needs any introduction to originalism. For decades, uh, originalist judges and scholars have contended that the Constitution must be interpreted according to its original meaning. And that interpretive philosophy has had a very important real-world impact in a whole bunch of areas of law, you know, in, in, a, in a, um, gun rights, and religion, and abortion, and separation of powers. And the footprint of originalism is likely to grow. There's a critical block of uh, sitting Supreme Court justices that are originalists. Uh, there's a whole bunch of lower court judges and scholars who are originalists also. But even as originalism has ascended in significance, even as it has expanded its purview, there's this domain of constitutional law that it has largely overlooked, and that's civil procedure. So what is civil procedure? Civil procedure is the law that determines how substantive law is going to be established and applied. Civil procedure tells you which system of courts you can sue in, in state courts or federal courts tells you which state court you can sue in and which federal court within the federal system. It tells you who's going to be adjudicating your case, how your case is going to be resolved, you know, how your harms are going to be remedied, how your property is going to be taken from you in the form of a damages uh, award. So I understand if you're not a lawyer, why that sort of thing might not sound very exciting. Uh, even if you are a lawyer, uh, that sort of thing may not sound very exciting. Um, but civil procedure is a fundamental part of our system of justice. It's so fundamental that it's part of the required 1L curriculum at pretty much every law school. And in most places, it's part of the required fall 1L curriculum. It's a type of law that lawyers and judges need to use and do use every single day without even thinking about it. So what does civil procedure have to do with originalism? Well, civil procedure implicates the Constitution. When a court decides a case, it has to have subject matter jurisdiction over the case. It has to have the power to decide it. It has to have personal jurisdiction over the defendant. 
Article 3 and the due process clauses of the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendment are going to matter to, uh, to those questions. Right there at the outset of a lawsuit when the court is first exercising jurisdiction over the suit and the parties. The Constitution continues to be important as the case proceeds through litigation. When a court grants a motion for summary judgment or a motion for judgment as a matter of law, those orders cannot infringe on the Seventh Amendment jury trial right. When the, when the court issues a decree at the end of the case, a declaratory judgment or an injunction, those orders have to comply with the court's constitutional powers as well. So the point is, is that the, uh, the Constitution matters to civil procedure. You'd therefore think that civil procedure would matter to originalists. And you'd especially think that originalists would care about civil procedure because the law of constitutional civil procedure is just not very originalist. So I'll give some examples of this later on, but for now, just take my word for it that the non-originalism of civil procedure is pretty obvious to anyone who cares to look. So the surprising thing, though, is that until very recently, um, the originalists have had very little to say about civil procedure. And this belated movement to procedural originalism that we are now beginning to see germinate and unfold, it's worth examining both for its potential implications for civil procedure and also for its potential challenges and implications for originalism. Civil procedure has the potential to serve as a, as a testing ground or a petri dish for originalism. It will help us to see whether originalism is an interpretive method that originalists are committed to applying come what may, or whether instead originalism is a method that is pursued only when it brings about certain substantive outcomes that are desired. So these are the topics that I'm going to explore this evening. And my story here tonight is not going to be just about constitutional law. It's also going to involve some history, uh, some theory, and some politics. And that's because this movement to procedural originalism must be understood not as if it were just some free-floating legal claim that has arisen in a vacuum. Instead, it must be situated within and understood within a thicker historical and political context as a new and an unfamiliar phase of the political practice of originalism. So to that end, I'm going to begin by reviewing the backstory of the originalist movement and how it's largely uh, failed to engage with questions of civil procedure. Then I'm going to explain how more recently there's been a shift in originalist discourse to address procedure. I'll next talk about some implications of civil procedure for various types of originalism. And finally, I'm going to talk about what originalism, uh, what civil procedure may show us about whether originalism is at its core a political enterprise rather than a theory of law, as so many critics of originalism maintain. So let me begin by this uh, civil procedure shaped hold in originalist discourse. So the, the modern uh, originalist movement began to crystallize in the period following Brown versus Board of Education when the Warren and the Burger courts were issuing a slew of momentous decisions concerning race, school prayer, sexual privacy and abortion, and criminal law. So if you go back to this founding period and you revisit the writings of the founding fathers of originalism, and I use the term fathers advisedly, what you see is an overwhelming focus on substantive constitutional law and at its perceived mangling at the hands of the Warren and the Burger courts. So I'm talking here about men like Raoul Berger, Antonin Scalia, Robert Bork, and Edwin Meese, the men who put originalism on the intellectual map of American legal culture. So these men wrote and spoke prolifically and passionately about substantive constitutional doctrine, but they barely broached the topic of civil procedure. Raoul Berger, for one, wrote an entire book about the 14th Amendment. Um, and its original intent, a book that had an explosive effect on constitutional debate in the 1970s and 80s. The Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment is directly relevant to personal jurisdiction, but his chapter on the Due Process Clause did not once mention that body of doctrine or criticize it. There's a similar lacuna in the writings of Robert Bork and of Edwin Meese. Bork was a judge on the DC Circuit, where he routinely had to address issues of civil procedure. Meese was Reagan's attorney general, and in that role, he oversaw the civil litigation of the entire Department of Justice. 
But despite these men's obvious familiarity with civil procedure, neither of them wrote or spoke about what originalism might entail for civil procedure. Last but not least, consider Justice Scalia, perhaps still the most famous originalist. In Burnham versus Superior Court, he drew on uh, originalist and tradition-based arguments to write a, a, a brilliantly written opinion that sustained the constitutionality of tag jurisdiction. But he did not demur or object when the court applied non-originalist precedents in many other cases involving civil procedure that came before him while he was a judge. So I, I choose these figures, I focus on them, because they are especially important because of their uh, prominent role in shaping originalism in its early days. But much the same point could be made for many other originalists of, uh, at this time. Their orientation was on reforming substantive constitutional law, not on procedure. And that focus on substance continued to dominate originalist discourse in subsequent years. By the 1980s and the 1990s, originalist argumentation had developed concerning gun rights, the non-delegation doctrine, the administrative state, the commerce clause, and various other areas of substantive constitutional law. Conversely, there continued to be very little concern expressed about what originalism entailed for civil procedure. So recently, recently, there has been a shift in the air. In just the last five or six years, prominent originalist scholars such as Larry Solom and Stephen Sachs uh, have published uh, new articles about civil procedure and originalism. And some of the justices have um, apparently been paying attention. So the first inklings of this appeared quite unexpectedly in the 2021 decision in Ford Motor Company. So Ford was a personal jurisdiction case. The court, the court sustained the exercise of personal jurisdiction over Ford by applying the international shoe test uh, for specific personal jurisdiction. But what's notable for my purposes tonight is the concurring opinion by Justice Gorsuch, uh, joined by Justice Thomas. In his concurrence, Justice Gorsuch questioned whether international shoe was consistent with original meaning. International shoe, Justice Gorsuch explained, had created a new test, traditional notions of fair play and substantial justice, to evaluate whether the exercise of personal jurisdiction was consistent with due process. But the right question, stated Justice Gorsuch, was what the Constitution, as originally understood, requires, not what nine judges consider fair and just. He concluded with a frank request. Hopefully, future litigants and lower courts will help us to face these challenges and sort out a responsible way, uh, face these tangles and sort out a responsible way to address the challenges posed by our changing economy in light of the Constitution's text and the lessons of history. So this concurrence was a kind of call for papers or a bat signal of the sort that originalist justices sometimes issue. And very often these calls for papers are one-offs. They don't lead to much. But then just over a year later, uh, the court granted cert in Mallory versus Norfolk Southern, which is still pending. Uh, and that's another case at the intersection of civil procedure and originalism. The party in the amicus briefs in Mallory devoted substantial attention to original meaning. Uh, and so did the justices at oral argument. So this is a huge contrast from just a few years ago in 2014, when original meaning was not even raised in uh, the argument or the, the briefing in the run-up to the personal jurisdiction uh, decision in a case called Walden versus Fiore. So as both Ford and Mallory indicate, the movement to originalism and civil procedure looks like it may have legs. So the question then is, well, now what? Well, one initial thing to understand is that if originalists do start to care about civil procedure in a sustained way, there is plenty of doctrine that is vulnerable. So this is going to be easier for you to un understand if you are a lawyer or a law student, uh, but I'm just going to put a couple of examples on the table just to make this more concrete. So think about subject matter jurisdiction and when a federal court exercises diversity jurisdiction between a citizen of a state and a citizen of another state. Now today, we take it for granted that corporations, like Ford Motor Company, uh, and not just flesh and blood people, can be citizens for diversity purposes. But that was not how the term citizen was understood at the founding or in the early decisions of the Supreme Court. 
Indeed, it is still not how the term citizen is understood for a whole bunch of other constitutional provisions. But back in the 19th century, for complicated reasons having to do with forum shopping, the Supreme Court reversed course on this question and decided it would be a good idea to treat corporations, qua corporations, as citizens for Article III diversity jurisdiction purposes. And that understanding has remained with us today. Similarly, if you are a citizen of DC, you're not a citizen of a state, you're a citizen of the District of Columbia. If you're a citizen of Puerto Rico, you're not a citizen of a state, you're a citizen of a territory. But today, because of a 1940s decision called Tidewater, citizens of the District of Columbia and citizens of uh, the territories are treated as citizens of a state for purposes of diversity jurisdiction. Last but not least, take the 14th Amendment's due process clause. So the a case I mentioned earlier, International Shoe, said that a state court could exercise personal jurisdiction uh, over an out-of-state defendant if that would be consistent with the demands <coughs> of fair play and substantial justice. And the Shoe Court treated that test as being something that was entailed by or baked into uh, the, the, the due process clause itself. But the original meaning of the due process clause, as various originalist scholars uh, have pointed out, might entail no such thing. As a matter of original meaning, it may instead be the case that the exercise of personal jurisdiction over an out-of-state defendant is perfectly fine if the exercise of jurisdiction complies with the positive law enacted by the state, or even with unwritten principles of general law. On either view, the international shoe framework, which treats uh, uh, personal jurisdiction as a function of what judges decide is fair or just, I, on either view, uh, the international shoe framework is not something that's, that's baked into or entailed by the due process clause. So these are just three examples. And I could have used more. You know, for, for example, uh, summary judgment, or judgment as a matter of law, uh, and the grave tension between these mechanisms and the Seventh Amendment's jury trial right. Uh, or uh, we could talk about the way that Gibbs versus United Mine Workers define the scope of a case for purposes of supplemental jurisdiction. Uh, or we could talk about the Erie Doctrine, which Jack Goldsmith has recently called one of the most dr dramatically anti-originalist opinions in Supreme Court history. Uh, there are lots of areas in which constitutional civil procedure is in serious tension with original meaning. So some of these doctrines are old, <coughs> some are new, some rely on venerable precedent, and some rely on rickety precedent. What they have in common is three things. They fall within the domain of constitutional civil procedure, they aren't originalist, and yet until recently, originalists have made no quarrel with their continued application. So, for example, in 1988, a judge like Robert Bork could affirm a grant of summary judgment in a suit involving a DC corporation suing in diversity, a holding that in at least three separate ways produced a result that is in serious tension with the Constitution's original meaning. All right, so let's turn to what all of this might mean for originalists today. Are these and other staple doctrines of civil procedure destined for the chopping block? Will originalists demand uh, the wholesale jettisoning of all of these non-originalist elements of civil procedure? So this is an important thing to understand about originalism. We're gonna get into a little bit of the theory of originalism here. Originalism has many variations. Uh, there are many versions of originalists. A very many types of originalism, and, and, and different schools may respond in different ways to the non-originalism of civil procedure. So I'm gonna group these theories initially into two big buckets. One bucket that addresses how originalism should be operationalized, and another bucket that addresses how origi originalism should be justified. On the operational side of things, consider the question of precedent. This is a hugely important question. Some originalists accept that original meaning can legitimately yield in the face of transformative or long-standing non-originalist precedent. For originalists who accept that, and, and certainly not all of them do, the big question is which precedents can stay and which ones must go. 
Again, on the operational side of things, consider that most originalists embrace a distinction between interpretation and construction. That is to say, they accept that courts must sometimes construct the legal meaning rather than excavate it from the text of the Constitution. For these originalists, a lot depends on how capaciously they conceive of, of what they refer to as the construction zone. So turning to the other uh, bucket, the justification side, there are originalists who rest their commitment to original, originalism upon the stated belief that originalism has the functional benefits of stabilizing the law and constraining judicial discretion. And then finally, there are positivist originalists who contend that originalism is our law because our current legal commitments make it our law. All right, so with this sort of brief uh, introduction to this theoretical map of originalism in hand, let's think about how each of these families of originalist thought might respond to or cope with civil procedures and non-originalism. So let's start with precedent. Originalists who are willing to live with settled non-originalist precedent may conclude that say a case, as, a case as old and established as, for example, international shoe should be preserved, even if shoe got the original meaning of the due process clause wrong. Originalists who have a capacious view of construction uh, may, may conclude that Article 3 can be constructed to allow uh, corporations to be treated as citizens or the District of Columbia to be treated as a state. For consequentialist originalists, Civil procedural non-originalism may appear to be nonetheless sufficiently stable and constraining upon judges, and therefore not a practical concern. <clears throat> Positive, or, positivist originalists may contend uh, for their part that the civil procedure cases don't contain the express repudiation of original meaning by the justices in the majority that the positivists have demanded as counter evidence to their thesis. So in these and other ways, different schools of originalists may, at least as an initial matter, at a first cut, make efforts to reconcile original, originalism and the non-originalism landscape, non-religious landscape of civil procedure. But I don't think that any of these responses are complete or satisfying. Even if you take those responses on board, Civil procedures non-originalism still presents important and challenging questions that originalists will need to grapple with. For example, civil procedure should prompt those originalists who accept non-originalist precedent to specify with more precision which non-originalist precedents merit deference and why they merit that deference. So if, say, international shoe is a decision that's sufficiently hallowed by time and reliance to merit retention, as many originalists may be drawn to conclude. Then may, may the same be said of home uh, building and loan versus Laidell, which was decided more than a decade beforehand. What about Wickard v versus Filbert, which predates Shu by three years? Originalists have called for both of these decisions to be overturned. For originalists who are committed to uh, construction, civil procedure should prompt them to specify what counts as an acceptable degree of construction. In international shoe, for example, the court lost the due process clause in, in a way that has entailed the invalidation of some long-standing state laws. If, if originalists uh, conclude that international shoe was just engaging in legitimate gloss or construction, then why can't the same be said of Roe or Casey or Obergefell? Or to turn to Article 3, if the treatment of the District of Columbia as a state ought to count as a valid construction of Article 3, then may the very same word state in Article 1 be constructed tomorrow to allow the District of Columbia to send uh, representatives and senators to Congress? For originalists who claim to value originalism for creating stability and constraint on judges, doesn't the non-originalism of civil procedure show that you can get at least a decent amount of stability and constraint without originalism? And if that's the case, why be originalist? And finally, for positivist originalists who, who contend strikingly that originalism is our law, we might find it useful to ask of them, well, if that's the case, then how come so much non-originalist civil procedure is our law? <laughs> so these are the kinds of challenging questions that civil procedure will pose for originalist scholars and originalist judges. And whether you are an originalist or not, there's a couple of lessons to be drawn from this going forward. 
One, and this is one of the main takeaways that I would like you to carry with you this evening. One is that originalism, as it is currently constructed and theorized, can be very selective in its application. There is considerable tension between originalists sweeping in absolute pronouncements concerning originalism's scope on the one hand, and its actual deployment in various areas of law on the other. Originalists have framed their approach as being part and parcel of the baseline obligation of judging as the only method that can sensibly be brought to bear in interpreting a written constitution and in resolving constitutional disputes in a constitutional democracy. But as civil procedure illustrates vividly, originalist modes of argument can be, and indeed have been, deployed very selectively. And as theories of originalism have uh, grown more nuanced, or as law professors like to say, sophisticated, uh, originalism has become still more well supplied with avenues through which originalist judges might selectively reject or preserve particular non-originalist features of our law whether by discretionarily retaining non-originalist precedent, by relying on construction or other methods. And so that tees up the second takeaway. Paying attention to the selectivity of originalism, which is what civil procedure helps us to do, is important because that macro level pattern of originalist argumentation may help us to gauge the extent to which politics is the driving force behind the application of originalism. So now let's turn to that broader question. What might civil procedure tell us about the politics of originalism? So we are all familiar with the claim by critics of originalism that originalism is nothing more than a cover to advance conservative political commitments uh, in the language of constitutional law. As Professor uh, Aziz Huck has put it, originalism has purported to be something that is moving outside politics but it is in its origins and in the way it has been applied in the courts, tightly linked to a particular partisan political orientation. So this, uh, this Venn diagram is, uh, you know, is my uh, effort to visualize or illustrate this claim. That there's a the claim that there's a near total degree of overlap between conservative political preferences and originalist legal conclusions. <laughs> so notice, however, that like originalists themselves, the critics of originalism have focused on questions of substantive constitutional law in substantiating this criticism on issues like abortion, gun rights, and so forth. Uh, and they have explained how originalism on these issues has seemed to very closely track conservative preference. So what civil <coughs> procedure offers us is, uh, is, a, is a new terrain against which to test the relationship of originalism and conservative politics. Originalism on civil procedure is a new and different kettle of fish than the originalism that we have seen before. It could produce a set of outcomes uh, that has no ev evident overlap with uh, conservative preference. And in fact, in fact, originalism on civil procedure may produce outcomes that conservatives may actively disfavor. For example, business conservatives would staunchly oppose ousting corporations from the federal diversity docket. Corporations almost always prefer litigating in federal courts. If the court tomorrow were to uh, resurrect the originalist rule that only natural persons can be Article III citizens, that would seriously complicate, it might even obliterate, corporate access to the federal diversity docket, and it would therefore draw staunch opposition from conservatives. Similarly, business conservatives would not likely be in favor of getting rid of the special jurisdictional protections for corporations that might have to go if the court tomorrow jettisoned the international shoe test and the doctrine that's been built on it. Consider, too, the pending Mallory case. The plaintiff in Mallory argues that, as a matter of original meaning, the state of Pennsylvania may require a corporation to consent to general personal jurisdiction as a condition of registering to do business in Pennsylvania. Now, there's a very persuasive case that the plaintiff in Mallory is right about that. But adopting that result could lead to nationwide corporations being subjected to nationwide plaintiff-side forum shopping uh, in plaintiff-friendly states like Mississippi, 
So that is why the Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, and various conservative legal groups filed amicus briefs on the defendant railroad side. The point is that civil procedure is a domain in which originalism and conservatism are far from wholly aligned. Civil procedure therefore offers a petri dish in which to observe the relative influence of principle and politics on originalism. The pattern of originalism's future uh, engagement with civil procedure will offer us a fresh way to test just how dependent originalism is upon broader conservative political commitments. If civil procedure recedes as a concern for originalist scholars and it never gains traction amongst originalist judges, or if only those parts of it with conservative political support gain momentum, then that would be telling. Conversely, if originalism uh, were to gain momentum across the board in civil procedure, even when it resulted in uh, outcomes that were not aligned with or adverse to conservative preference, then that may reflect that originalism is becoming disentangled, at least to some extent, from the agenda of conservative politics. So I hasten to add that here, as everywhere else in the world, the proof will be in the pudding. Uh, the possibility does exist that procedural uh, originalism may be used instrumentally. It could be used to assist in the achievement of results that uh, conservatives desire by destabilizing disfavored doctrines in collateral areas of law, or by destabilizing stare decisis more generally. Or it could be used instrumentally to burnish originalism's claims to neutrality and political autonomy. But regardless of how matters unfold, the area of civil procedure and its intersection with originalism is a space that's well worth watching uh, for constitutional theorists of all stripes. Thank you. So people with questions, please uh, come down the aisles and uh, speak into the microphones. I was wondering if the plaintiff's bar on the mass tort side is pushing the change to international shoe, or are, are they pushing the, uh, this doctrine? So in the, in the Mallory case, there were several amicus briefs that were filed by organizations uh, plaintiff's bar organizations, and that they were pushing an original meaning uh, argument. Um, their, their view was that th the argument that was made by the plaintiff's side in Mallory is that uh, it did not require an overturning of international shoe, but rather it was consistent with international shoe's acceptance of consent-based uh, regimes to personal jurisdiction. Thank you. I'm David Furwich. I'm a practitioner, not a student or an academic. Um, but I wrestle with personal jurisdiction issues in my practice, and I find the law very unsatisfactory. Um, and, and I don't think it has a coherent doctrine to it. Um, and one of the questions I've focused on, there are many, but one of the questions I've focused on is what role does federalism have in the doctrines of personal jurisdiction? And we see the Supreme Court opinions often say fairness and federalism, okay? But they never explain what federalism really means, and it doesn't seem to apply, it create any kind of rule of decision, okay? Like, well, how would federalism make a difference in a particular case? Um, you know, I when I started thinking about, like, the ancient origins of personal jurisdiction, I thought of it in terms of state, state sovereignty, okay, and, and then federalism. Um, but you cite some some read some academics, particularly uh, Professor Reddish, who say federalism never had anything to do with doctrines of personal jurisdiction. Um, and you know maybe this maybe the original doctrines were just like ancient medieval ideas. You know, like you you come into my realm, and you know I can seize your body. You know, where you have you bring your goods into my realm, I can seize your goods. But I'm curious about. You, you quote a lot of these people who are saying federalism isn't an issue. I'm just curious, what is your view? Do you think it really has anything to do with, for, with the original meaning of personal jurisdiction? Thank you. So um, I appreciate the question coming from a, a practitioner. And, and uh, 
um, and that, th that these theoretical, it's, it's heartening to know that these theoretical questions do matter in the actual practices law, of law uh, as well. Um, so it's a, it's a, and it's an excellent question, like the due process clause, uh, you know, it's, it's not like the commerce clause or the spending power, right? it's, not, it's not part of the uh, listed among the structural provisions of the constitution that, that allocate power to Congress uh, or, or, or by implication not, uh, not to con Congress. Um, so what does it have to do with federalism? Um, you know, Martin Reddish uh, has famously long ago argued that, the, that uh, Penoyer versus Neff had wrongly linked federalism to the due process clause um, and uh, you know, imported a set of considerations there that, that, weren't, uh, that weren't really relevant. Um, I think, and, and, and as you point out, state sovereignty uh, matters a great deal to personal jurisdiction, and, and you might think of state sovereignty as being the correct uh, rubric through which to, to look at it. Many aspects of our current civil procedure doctrine can only really be explained by reference to these old ideas um, of state sovereignty. They're very hard to explain as a function of fairness and, 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 and justice and fair play. Um, so, so federalism, and state sovereignty, I think, do have a continuing role in shaping uh, doctrine. And they are, their linkage to the due process clause's original meaning is, is, a, is a bit complicated. So um, under the, what, the due, what the due process, if the due process clause uh, was meant to just make sure that a, a court that had jurisdiction, proper jurisdiction, over the case could issue a judgment, then then, uh, then, it's, uh, th then the due process clause would be incorporating principles of judgment enforcement that are not written in the Constitution or part of the due process clause itself, but that are enforced via the due process clause. So if, 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 if a state only has jurisdiction to, over cases that fall within its sovereign powers as a state, it's, it's a violation of the due process clause for it to seek to adjudicate those cases, um, for, it, for it to adjudicate cases other than those cases, right? For it, for it to reach out beyond its borders and try to adjudicate cases that don't belong within its sphere of sovereignty. This, it's, so state sovereignty is, would be then, in, on that view, state sovereignty would be enforced via the due process clause, uh, but it would not, but, it, but um, the due process clause itself would not create like a, a free-floating requirement that the exercise of jurisdiction be fair. Instead, you would just be looking to see what sort of cases a particular state sovereign had the power to adjudicate. And that would be determined by looking to, uh, you know, the pre-existing principles of general law that governed the allocation of power amongst sovereign states. So basically to international law. So, I mean, so this is, um, so, so as I said, it's a complicated uh, sequence of moves that you have to make to get, from, uh, to get from the due process clause to the powers of states vis-a-vis -vis each other. Um, but I, I do believe that it's possible to discern uh, that, that whole sequence of steps. But are you saying that sovereignty is the primary value and due process is the, the mechanism by which it's enforced? Yes, so that, that is one uh, way to boil it down, right? That the, that the due process clause uh, can be seen as just uh, the, a way for enforcing the, and limiting states so that they only adjudicate cases that are actually within their sovereign power. Uh, I had a quick question. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, you, you talked about uh, uh, different ways that this could resolve itself, whether originalism becomes less politically viewed or um, whether there are exceptions. I'm curious, do you have any predictions on how this will fall out? Will it not get very much attention? Will it get attention and it will lead some way? But I'm curious what your prediction is. Yeah, it's so, you know, it's so hazardous to make uh, predictions, especially about the future. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, uh, I don't, you know, I, I do think that there is, um, there is a, just a growing interest amongst the originalist justices in these procedural questions, also questions of originalism in remedies, questions of originalism in fed courts. Um, 
You know, I think that the Gorsuch... I think that Justice Gorsuch is... I think that Justice Gorsuch's concurring opinion in Ford um, was, was came from a place of, of, of you know, true uh, intellectual curiosity about, um, you know, about, about this this issue, um, and I think it's just very hard to maintain um, to maintain a wall of um, a wall between substance and everything else in the in the way that that's, that that the. Uh, that the discourse of originalism has, has played itself out. Um, so I would say, like, if I, 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 I really feel that it would be difficult for me to confidently predict, but I, I, would, I would think that at least for, you know, over the next, you know, few years, we'll see, you know, maybe more cert grads on this question. I think litigants will, will understand that, that um, cases that can be framed to make originalist arguments should, you know, should be framed that way in order to attract interest from, um, in order to attract interest from the originalist justices. And so there, you know, there's kind of a supply side as well as a demand side to this question that, you know, that may keep this, these such issues before the court um, for the next several years. Thank you, Professor, for uh, your talk. We generally think, you know, we have more or less evidence on the original meaning of various constitutional provisions. I'm just curious, which of the examples you provide you think shows the starkest divide between current doctrine and the original meaning uh, would provide the most kind of dispositive test uh, as we look forward to the Supreme Court's kind of commitment to originalism? Yeah, thank you. So, you know, of the examples that um, that I talk about here, uh, I talked about here and that I discuss um, in my paper, I mean, I think that the Article Three examples, both um, this, the corporations and uh, the its, uh, both corporations and its application to uh, citizens of the District and of, uh, of, of Columbia, I think both of those uh, are are really quite clear. Uh, so, if you'd like to go, you know, if you, if you want to just sort of do the math yourself and uh, and see some pretty clear examples. Those are those are two very good places to start, and as as my exchange uh, earlier showed, the due process clause is a, is a bit trickier. It's it, it's it's uh, challenging to understand uh, the linkage between original meaning and um, uh, and the due process clause. But the Article Three examples are much simpler. Hello, uh, yeah, my name's Dave. Private citizen. Uh, in terms of the near future, I would forecast there's going to be a lot of issues coming before the court regarding uh, the Indian Constitution. Like, for example, currently people are concerned about the possession of firearms because of the perceived increase in violence in our country. Now, I believe there should be a concern about the increase in violence in our country. Now, some people are going to start to argue, is it the gun or is it the person? So there's going to be debates on this that I'm sure are going to go to the courts. Now, in terms of issues regarding sovereignty as a country, that is going to become an issue before the courts on numerous occasions because of current attempts to insist that people who are citizens of other countries have constitutional rights equal to those of a citizen of the United States. So the question I have for you is at this time, are we not going to see a lot of questions like this come up involving a regional intent or I would put it under a category of sovereignty of constitutional law within the borders of the United States? Yes, I think. Clear enough? Yes. I think we will have a number of cases <coughs> raising questions of original meaning. Uh, involving all kinds of substantive areas of law, among them gun rights and immigration. Um, I was curious about how originalism would interact with the FRCP. Um, I'm interested in like mass torts and class actions, so I was wondering. 
Yeah, so you know, in, in some ways it's like there's a, there's a very like simple answer, which is that you know, originalism doesn't really need to interact with the FRCP per se. What it ought to be interacting with is the Rules Enabling Act, <laughs> you know, and and is that okay, right? Because is that is that is that constitutional? The, the, the rules of civil procedure fall out of the Rules Enabling Act, um, but is the Rules Enabling Act all right or not? Um, and uh, and so so that's a that's like a meta procedural question <laughs> that um, uh, that you know originalism. May also take a look at it. Interestingly, that 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 question has been addressed a little bit more on the administrative law side, because you can one way you can think of the Rules Enabling Act is as being just a massive delegation of authority to the federal courts to promulgate a whole system of civil procedure, right? And so then the and on the non-delegation doctrine side, there have been originalists who um, who have uh, grappled with whether that type of delegation of Rulemaking authority is all right. Thank you for coming to speak with us. Um, I was hoping you could elaborate a little more on what you thought, think we can learn about the origins or um, motivations of originalist jurisprudence from how, from what we see in either the growth or not of originalist civil procedure. On the one hand, you know, I can see it being, you know, it's been a commitment to principle all along, but on the other, it may just be, or you know, an, another plausible explanation would be just taking the bitter along with the sweet. Sorry, can you explain the bitter along with the sweet? Just like, um, so if there are opinions that some conservatives, say business conservatives, in the example you gave, um, you know, it's contrary to their like, political balance or desired political outcome, mm -hmm. It might be that there's a strong commitment to principles of originalism across the board because of the commitment to the principle, or it could be that the, um, you know the importance of substantive issues, say guns, um, due process, the sort of things that we saw in the in the first phase of originalism are simply more important. Right. Yeah. So it's you know it, it's an excellent question, and um, you know my my purpose in in writing this paper is to just kind of foreground this area of law because it hasn't really been at the forefront of debates uh, about originalism. I mean, originalists haven't been worrying about civil procedure. Non-originalists haven't been worrying about constitutional theory of the constitutional theory of civil procedure. Nobody's been worrying about civil procedure except for people who love civil procedure. So, but now that it is, it is kind of on the table as being a place where originalists and, and uh, uh, where, where originalists are looking, you know, you, you 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 can start to think about whether you know, you know why hasn't it been there before? What you know what might what might happen to it? Um, so I think that. Um, so, you know, originalists who have read this paper have said to me, and they've said, have, said, have read this paper and said to me, you know, it's not surprising that originalists haven't worried about civil procedure. There's nothing odd about that. Civil procedure is hard and boring. You know, <laughs> I say, well, lots of things are hard and boring. Um, and originalists have uh, looked into them. I mean, they're all abstruse, complex question, questions of law that originalists have. Uh, dug into. So, you know, wh why, why not this? You know, others have said, well, there, there just weren't very many uh, originalists, you know, back in the day. So, and I say, well, look, there, you know, there were enough to dig into the originalist roots of, um, you know, the structural injunctions following Brown v. Board and whether they were consistent with Article Three equity. There was plenty of manpower to go around when the, when the question was one that seemed to be of interest, and then some. Some say, "Well, you know, it's 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 just so boring so these questions." And I say, "Well, this is that's the whole point, right? Like, it, originalism cannot cannot acquit itself of the charge of selectivity by saying the following: We are only going to be originalist in things that we're interested in being originalist about, right? That's not a defense. <laughs> um, and so this is this is why I think." Um, this, uh, this civil procedure is a you know, truly uh, interesting uh, question. You know, you will, um, your, your, 
it's it's very hard to you know look into the hearts and minds of a movement that's amorphous. You know, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that that's a possibility, but but you can look at objective results. You know, and so this is an area that deserves watching and tracking, uh, because you know the data that it uh, yields will be uh, revelatory. Uh, hello, thank you for the talk. Um, you kind of referred to this in your last response, but um, it makes sense to me why originalists from the 70s and 80s to you know, very recently have not been eager to dig into these questions because they don't necessarily align with their political ideology. But why do you think that non-originalists who write against originalism and have been writing, you know, kind of pointing out substantive inconsistencies, you know, with gun rights or with various other causes for the last, you know, since originalism basically came around, have ignored this. It seems like it was very strategic for them if they could point to this whole body of law, you know, and call originalists hypocrites. So why is it only within the last few years then that the non-originalists, legal academics and historians and people around the court have not paid attention to, I guess, you know, procedure? Yeah, so this is, I thought about this too. I mean, I think that there's this kind of, um, this, this is a, what you're putting your finger on is a kind of broader and I think a bit a healthy dynamic in our legal culture, which is, um, which is that in a lot of ways, non-originalists have been, uh, in, at least in the last 50 years or so, have, um, uh, have been sort of responsive or reactive in their stance. Uh, they've, um, you know, they've, They've been in a, in a kind of defensive posture, and so you know when uh, you can think of the you know on a chessboard you can think of you know the originalists as playing the the white squares, they, they move first and then the non-originalists come back with a with a counter right it, it, and um, uh, and and so it, I think that this is just a, an instance of that same dynamic um, where you know. You, if you walked into a room of civil procedure scholars and you, 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 know, you, and you asked the originalists to uh, raise their hands, there wouldn't, you wouldn't see any hands. You know, there weren't any originalists doing civil procedure a few years ago. Um, not, not really, like not to speak of. Um, and so it wasn't really meeting, like the field, the field wasn't really in a position of defending itself. And I don't think uh, civil procedure scholars were all that interested um, in uh, you know, in, in saying, hey, all of you originalists are just a bunch of hypocrites, right? So that wasn't something that anyone was, was, was interested in, um, in arguing. And, and, but now, however, the, the, kind of, the conversation is changing. Um, and when originalists start to make forays into this domain, um, then I think that as a response to that, you see non-originalists come back. That was delightful. Thank you for that talk. Um, I'm wondering whether your, uh, your test for hypocrisy is fair because you're using the business community as uh, standing for conservatives. But businesses are always going to do whatever makes them the most money. So it's sort of, that's sort of predictable. And if you could find a, uh, you know, a non business group of conservatives, or social conservatives, Think of a test for yeah, so that's interesting. I mean, I, and I, I want to point out that, like, this idea that originalists are inconsistent in their application of originalism to different areas of law, it's not just limited to civil procedure, right? So if you look at, um, you know, like, you know, the, the current pending um, cases, and, and so, sorry, and in some of those areas of law where originalism isn't being applied, you could say, oh, well, that's uh, you know, to apply originalism there would be a problem for other types of conservatives, not just business conservatives. Right? So one, car I think uh, currently pending are the affirmative action cases where there has been a lot of originalist argument being made uh, to the court that, uh, that, the, uh, that upholding affirmative action policies is actually consistent with original meaning. Um, and that's much more of a you know sort of regular conservative than business conservative uh, issue, right? So one 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 place where um, you know, that that's another area where you might look if you were looking to see whether 
originalists were committed to applying originalism um, across the board. I mean, that's, of course, assuming that they are convinced by those briefs and not by the, the other briefs on the other side. I, thank you. I, I've got a suggestion in response to this. How about the Second Amendment? The original meaning of the word arms was flintlocks, swords, clubs, knives, and hatchets, not AR-15s. Um, uh, is that a good example of selective interpretation by the originalists? I, you know, I am uh, really not a guns person, not in law, and not <laughs> elsewhere. So I, I, I just have to pass on that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming to speak with us. I was wondering if you could say more about the reception your paper has gotten. When you present this to originalist audience, do they take up the charge? Do they start talking about civil procedure? Do they dispute some of the specifics? What are they doing with this paper, and what sort of reception has it gotten? Yeah, thank you. So, so I should, you know, so I should say that I mean, if you read my paper, you'll see that I'm like citing the work of these recent originalist scholars like Stephen Sachs and, and, and Larry Solom and Max Crema and others, you know, there, there is originalist scholarship on, on, on all of these areas in these recent years. Um, and so you know, those, with those originalists, um, or at least with some of them, I've, I've just had very interesting and nice conversations about the, you know, about the particular doctrines in the paper. I also, um, I teach on the faculty of USD School of Law. We have a, um, I'm just going to do a little advertising here. We have a Center for Constitutional Originalism that <laughs> runs a conference every year that attracts a great deal of, uh, of scholars who are both originalists and not originalists. Um, and my colleagues on, on the USD faculty who are originalists have been extremely generous in engaging with me about uh, this paper. And, um, in particular, Michael Ramsey and Michael Rappaport um, you know, have, you know, have talked with me a lot about the challenges that originalism um, faces including, you know, for instance, whether or not to retain or abandon non-originalist precedent, like what counts as an okay amount of construction or just making stuff up, you know, when, when construction passes over the line from uh, construction to making stuff up. Um, and, and so we, you know, we have, um, you know, I have benefited a lot from, from having conversations with these originalists on my faculty and just from being kind of a, you know, an observer um, ex officio at, you know, year after year of these originalism conferences, um, you know, even though for years it was not uh, my uh, area of scholarly uh, interest, it was not my own methodology, I still attended, I learned a lot, and it really came in handy writing this paper. <laughs> We have time for maybe one more question. Hi there, my name is David. Thank you for the talk. Um, one thing that I'm really curious about is whether or not you think that there are some principles that undergird a lot of civil procedure jurisprudence. It seems to me like taking personal jur um, jurisdiction as an example, like maybe we can say that fairness is one of those and there's a tacit agreement that like you know, in some respects, civil procedure is beyond the scope of the Constitution, and that's why there hasn't been a lot of discussion. I'm just curious what you think about that. So, you know, civil procedure, I think, has, to, to my mind, I, I think of it as being an intensely uh, pragmatic subject. I think of it as a, as a subject that's been, um, that has, where the rules are, have been allowed to evolve, and in fact, they sort of have proudly evolved uh, alongside the changing uh, nature of our society um, as you know over over the years so I think of civil procedure as itself kind of encapsulating a, um, a pluralism and a, and a pragmatism um, that you know that, that actually in fact characterizes a lot of our law except for the bits of law that are now being made to be originalist <laughs> right so it, you know it's not that it's like a huge outlier there um, but the um, but the, you know, the, the allocations of powers between uh, you know, states and the federal government, between various courts and various parts of the country, um, you know, the types of you know, procedures and uh, processes that, that, that um, 
that, that, the, that the courts use as they're adjudicating cases. All of these things have been in constant flux. I mean, even the very jurisprudential understandings that we rely on, you know, ideas about general law or, 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 uh, or federal common law, all of these things have been in flux uh, you know, since, since the beginning. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's, particularly, it's particularly jarring, I think, to, to that type of law to suddenly uh, have kind of a, a cold bucket of original meaning <laughs> poured, poured over it. So uh, please join me in uh, thanking. <laughs>